everybody, it's May 27th, 2018, and this is your episode 147 of Ep Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as usual are Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. And Brian Calhoun is actually guest co-hosting with us. You might remember him from episode 0001. How's it going, Brian? <laughs> Brian, can you hear us? I was muted. It's going well. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to figure out this technology thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Do you know you have the most views of any of the episodes? I am honored, and I have no idea why. Well, there's a steady decline in viewership as we get further away <laughs> from your episode, so you're doing something. Well, I see why you called me back. I think it's because <laughs> Brian's our most attractive guest we've ever had. Uh, uh. <laughs> Says and, Ben, and we were still doing video back then, so that, might, that must that must be it. Yeah, we also have Yanny Black. How's it going? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> what, wait, why are you why are you laugh? Did you hear Yanny, Brian? I I heard Yanny. I, I said heard Laurel. Yanny. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely said Laurel. See, Very now that were clever. true, you'd be just like flying back and forth. You'd hear the same one. Anyway, oh, are you guys have you guys seen this little? You know, this was a natural thing for my little "What's the Sound" segment, but actually, we've kind of already covered this. Believe it or not, if you remember back on episode 125, I talked about someone named Diana Deutsch and her sound experiments and her sound illusions, and this Yanni versus Laurel thing. And by the way, if you don't know what this is. Just search for it real quick. It kind of blew up on the internet, but someone has recorded themselves saying Laurel, and then they have filtered out the lower frequencies, and to some people, it sounds like Yanny. So they say depending on which one you hear, it's uh, your, your ear's ability to pick out high and low frequencies, and if you hear Yanny, they say you have younger ears, and I say that in parentheses because it doesn't seem to exactly be true because another huge factor is what you're listening to it on. If you're listening to it in headphones with a lot of bass, you're more likely to hear Laurel. If you're just listening to it on your open cell phone, you're probably going to hear Yanny because it, the cell phone doesn't make low frequencies. But Laurel and I were messing around with this this morning, and actually on my first try, I was so proud of myself, I made the Laurel Yanny illusion on my digital audio workstation. I simply recorded myself saying Laurel, dropped it in, and then the first try with my frequency filter, I just tapered off the lows up to the highs, and it said Yanny. So that's simply how it works. And again, this is old news by Diana Deutsch, just reminding you she has something. And I, I kind of refreshed my memory on her sound illusions, and the one I think this is the closest to is the tritone paradox. So if you remember that experiment we did on episode 125, I played for you uh, a, a note going outward to a tritone in an octave, for example, F sharp going outward to Cs, both low and high. And some of you would say, oh, I heard a descending interval. Some of us would say, I heard an ascending interval. So that's her tritone paradox, and that's the same thing at work with this Yanni Laurel thing that kind of swooped the internet. So to any of you listeners, especially you young listeners, if you thought this Yanni Laurel thing was really interesting, I would really encourage you to look up Diana Deutsch because she has a whole lot of these experiments and this research and ones that are, in my opinion, a, a whole lot more uh, mysterious and mind toying with, and uh, you'll enjoy those. So yeah, anyway, long story short, Laurel Black is here. Hi, Laurel. Hey, and you spelled Deutsch, D-E-U-T-S-C-H. D-E-U-T-S-C-H. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's oh, all that I said. said. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It was a sound illusion. I didn't hear it. Oh, I won the fifth grade spelling bee. I know how to spell Deutsch. I know. Well, okay. I don't know how. Anyway, hey, you guys, our guest today, let me tell you about our guest. He has 38 years teaching in higher education and the most recent of which was the University of Arizona where he has where he he taught for 20 of those 38 years and has just recently retired so huge congrats to Norm on his Thanks. retirement he also has a very rich symphonic background and has performed under many many famous batons including Lucas Foss, Luciano Berrio, Albert, Alberto Hinastera, Christoph Penderecki and Leonard freaking Bernstein 
So, so many things we could ask him. He's published over 270 articles in journals and popular drum magazines and has written three books, The Guide to Standardized Drum Set Notation, The Electronic Drummer, and Demystifying MIDI. You can tell by listening to him that he just thinks he's a total big shot. So, hey, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a badass. Oh, yeah. See, what did, what did I tell you? You guys, this is Norman Weinberg. How you doing, Norm? I'm doing great. Hi. Uh, thanks for asking me to do this. I'm, I'm really honored that uh, I'm here and joining such a, 140 what? 147. Jeez, I would have thought I would have been like number six or seven. Oh, yeah, we've been going. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> You're no Brian Calhoun. Let's get this straight. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am. I'm really thrilled to be here. So thank you very much. Sure, you're Welcome very welcome. More. You know, we do sometimes get asked, you know, how do you guys pick the guests? How do you prioritize the guests? And a lot of times it's just, oh, I bumped into this person, and hey, by the way, well, I've got you here. Do you want to be here? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we do put some thought into it for sure. But w what's what's happening with you lately, Norm? Oh, let's see. Uh, well, we, I retired in last last May. Oh, almost. What's the date today? Is it the 22nd? Today is the 27th. 27th. Okay, so a year ago last week cool. was my last official day of being employed by the University of Arizona. How does it feel? It, it's pretty cool. I, I got to tell you that it's, it's very nice. And uh, you are all way too young, but when you get to the point to where you uh, can retire, I highly recommend it. Do you find you drink more or less now? Um... It's amazing how, well, as my wife used to say, this works, can I swear in front of you guys or not? Sure. Okay, this work shit really cuts into my day. <laughs> you know, and um, uh, it's, it's amazing how when you don't have to go into work, the day still fills up with all kinds of cool things. So, um, while there's while there's quite a few aspects of the position that I miss, there are also quite a few aspects that I don't miss, and um, I'm I'm really kind of enjoying setting my own schedule. And now I'm only doing the kind of things that I really want to do. Um, I mean, professionally, I'm doing a lot more uh, composing and and. Uh, uh, more writing and got some projects in the fire, those kind of things that it, it, it's tough to keep all those things going when you're teaching full time also. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm digging it. It's retirement is cool. Yeah, sure. What do you got there, Ben? Norm and I ran into each other a few months ago when I hosted my day of percussion event and I actually had one of his former students and a friend of mine uh, named Matt Jacklin as a guest, and he came to Tarleton and just kind of checked out the day with us, and uh, he had great day. fascinating stories to share, and I told him I'd like to for him to share his Keiko Abe story, but we'll do that later, because right now I want to ask about working with Leonard Bernstein. What was the oh. capacity that you worked with him, and what was that like? Okay, so I was a grad student at uh, Indiana University at the time. Uh, working on my master's, and you know, the, it was a big studio, and there were a lot of great folks there, and and there was a lot of stuff going on in that school, and so people were often called in to do other kinds of performances, and so there was a, a doctoral conducting major who, for his big project, wanted to do a performance of Leonard Bernstein's Trouble in Tahiti, which is a little small one-act operetta, I guess you would call it, uh, that he did when he was pretty young. And so I was asked to play uh, percussion. Uh, there's two percussion in the show. I was asked to play one of the parts. And uh, as it turns out, the guy who this project this was had run across Leonard Bernstein, I think at Tanglewood, told him that he was doing a performance of Trouble in Tahiti. And so Bernstein said, I'm having a Leonard Bernstein Festival in Israel next summer, why don't you come and do that piece? Yeah. So 
it was pretty cool. We all packed everything up and we went to Israel for, I think it was about 10 days. It was kind of a little traveling music festival. We played Tel Aviv, we played Jerusalem, we played Beersheba. We went around the country doing all of these uh, performances of this piece while other things were going on in the festival. So. Uh, this particular three days, there were all kinds of different groups performing Leonard Bernstein's music and then moved to another city and different groups and that kind of stuff. So uh, when we were in, I mean, I kind of put him down on the resume, although we didn't work together a lot. I actually did get to play under him. We were in Tel Aviv at the time and they were doing uh, uh, Chichester songs. I think it was Chichester Psalms, and they needed an extra percussionist. And somehow I got asked, so I got to play bass drum on Chichester Psalms with Bernstein conducting, and it was freaking awesome. That's amazing. Uh, with the, Israel Phil is a <laughs> a pretty pretty damn good band, and to have I mean he's been a advocate of Israel. He was an advocate of Israel, like from the founding of the country, and would go in maybe every year, every two years to conduct and give workshops and things like that. So when he came out on stage to work with the orchestra in rehearsal, I mean, just the whole orchestra was, sure, you know, uh, high strung about him being there and very, very excited. It, it was an amazing experience. I have a well, it's probably kind of a difficult question. Do you think, you know, we always talk about all the progress percussion has made in the very recent years, even in, even in, even in my lifetime. Do you think that conductors res respect percussionists more now because of a lot of these, you know, kind of there's a platform for solo percussion now. There are marimba concertos. There are a lot of well-respected composers that now have works for percussion. Do you think things have changed a lot, some, a little, none? I, it is kind of a difficult question to answer, and I think that a lot of it could very well depend on who the conductor is and kind of the age and, the, you know, if the conductor is a, a old-school soul kind of thing or a, a little bit more current in what's going on in the scene. Um, in my experience, conductors have kind of always known that a timpanist or a percussionist is a really, really important position. And it's not that other positions aren't important, but you know, you put a cymbal crash in the wrong place. <laughs> it's pretty critical stuff. And and I've always found that I think conductors respect the musicality and the artistic demands that even playing small accessory instruments. I mean, I've, I've never had the feeling of being disrespected or anything back there or thought that we're just, uh, the percussion section is just timekeepers and things like that. But there's, there's no question that um, now to have uh, a percussion guest artist come in is fairly commonplace where 20 to 30 years ago, I mean, you, you never saw it at all. Yeah. So I, I think that's been a big boost. I guess what made me think of it is if you guys seen that Leonard Bernstein conducting video and he's working with the triangle player. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know, people would share it and say like, look, he, even Leonard Bernstein cares about triangle players. And, but it's kind of, I don't, I did not find it pleasant to watch i thought no there's another one of him talking to the principal trumpet on a recording of west side story have you heard that one no i haven't heard that one yeah that's another one where the trumpet player is trying to tell the maestro that uh he's doing it right and you know it, it's just that as as often first principal trumpet players are or do or have, there's a little attitude thing going on. Yeah. It's a tense moment, yeah. <laughs> have you seen it? it? It's 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 pretty cool. Uh, but you know, I, I it isn't it, it isn't cool for the conductor to behave that way. But also if you listen to the part, I mean the guy was kinda I don't know who that was and I feel sorry for him now that he's on 
<laughs> YouTube and kind of infamous for that. Um, but, you know, it, it, as an orchestral player, your answer to everything is yes, maestro. And, you know, can you get a better sound on that? Yes, maestro. And you do whatever you can to, to do that because he's the person with the musical vision that you have to follow. And if you're lucky, uh, they trust you uh, and you can be your creative self and do things that you want to do without being called on the carpet. Uh, but if you do get called on the carpet, you have to make it right. I mean... There's in an orchestra. There's certainly a hierarchy of where the buck stops, and the buck always stops as a conductor. Did that answer your your question? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think so. It's just, yeah, and I it, I wouldn't have thought of it if not if we hadn't been talking about Leonard Bernstein. But um, yeah, I don't know. He's he's trying to get him to do this thing with the triangle and. I don't know, you know, the way he's talking to him is like, I don't know how you do it. And like, I don't really care, but just like, uh, make it happen. Like, I don't, I don't know. And, and I've never felt disrespected by a conductor either or thought they treat the percussionists as second class citizens. But I felt like that video and then like the orchestra was like laughing, like, oh, isn't this cute? We're trying to do the triangle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like, that, well wait, that's like, for the members of the orchestra, not so much the podium. Like it was, yeah, it's like kind of this, like, oh, look at this novelty little thing we get a, this little tangent we get to do before, while we're doing real music. Let's deal with yeah. this. You know, I don't know. I'm just wondering, like, does that happen less now? Now that percussion has hopefully, like, moved a little more forward. Sorry, Ben, what's up? Uh, I will say, like, this, this, I think it all, what this all comes back to for me is that note in the score for the Bartok Sonata for two pianos and percussion. <laughs> exactly. Where it says, like, they don't quote me on what the exact words are, but it's something like one of the pianists should supervise the percussionists yeah. to make sure that all of the composer's indications are handled adequately. You're like, you know, I mean, yeah, no one needs I'm to not, supervise yes. percussionists. Yes, yeah, like, I'm not being a special snowflake here. Like, we have seen this change. Like, you would never write that now, you know, no. in a score. And, and it would, I mean, I'm... <sighs> Uh, I, I've been in performances of the bar talk where it was up to the percussion section to make sure that the piano players were playing their part right. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that too. <laughs> um, yeah, this reminds yeah. me of like the the triangle thing. Um, have you seen? There's some commercial. I don't know. It's completely irrelevant what the commercial is for. But in it, you have the Geico. Like, yeah. A, a, oh, it's a Geico, of course. Yeah. There's an orchestra concert. Everyone in tuxedos, and then there's a triangle. The triangle player basically comes forward like it's a triangle concerto and just kind of right. quasi rocks out cadenza like and it's sort of the butt of the joke is like yeah. oh yeah the percussionist is going to get a solo or the triangle would ever have a featured moment i think it's sort of like percussion is, has a history of being the the it what does. is it the, the black sheep or whatever but i am also reminded of this story and i forget i think it might have been um the late John Grimes, the timpanist in Boston, um, who told me that a lot of the first timpani players were trumpeters who lost their teeth and could no longer play, but they could tune a drum and played the same part. Like in Beethoven's symphonies, trumpets and timpani are almost identical. And so initially, the first, some of the founding percussionists in our history were kind of like afterthoughts. They were the, they could no longer be real musicians like trumpet players. So they had to fill in to hit the drum because they knew how to tune it. Anyway, I just thought it was sort of a yeah. historical origin of this. Well, this I, I think that I've got two things I want to say along those lines. I think it's surprising, or it's maybe not surprising. Maybe it's better to say it's not surprising. How many timpanists in major symphony orchestras are also violinists or started out on violin or also pianists or started out on piano and that they are, this is gonna sound weird, but they are musicians first who just happen to play percussion rather, they are, rather than percussionists who just happen to play timpani or, you know, the, the, the thing that we all do, the thing that we all really do is be musicians. And I think that maybe that was, could it be that that's the history behind making fun of the triangle player or uh, 
making fun of the tambourine players that they were they weren't really the musicians they were the people that uh, how many times in your career from say middle school on up have you needed an extra percussionist and they get like one of the double bass players to come over and cover that part right it's like you know no you can't do that you you know unless you want to invite me to come over and play the double bass part that's not going to happen yeah and then the the other thing i wanted to just kind of mention um and maybe this is going to uh, piss some viewers off and stuff but i've spent a lot of my career trying to not be made fun of yeah you know if if that makes sense and so there is a um there is a group of there's a, a a large repertoire of novelty percussion and i think that some of the pieces that are kind of novelty percussion and i'm not talking about ragtime i'm talking about other stuff that um, is very clever and still very well composed that i think is great fun and great music and great pedagogical materials but then there's this whole other group of stuff which I think is composed to have the audience, and that, that humor in music is great, and laughing along to, to music I think is okay, but making fun of what we do I don't think is okay. And um, I've often had, you know, in my teaching students come up and say, you know, could we do this particular piece in percussion ensemble? And my answer on some of those suggestions is no. I've, I've spent too much of my career trying not to have people laugh at us. Uh, if they want to laugh with us, that's a different thing. But to, to make fun of what we do, I'm not interested. So there's my soapbox for this. No, that's great. Laura? Yeah. Well, my thing is back to um, the note in the Bartok score, just to say that um, we're not the only people that have been written about like that. I can't remember who it was. I think it's Handel. Don't quote me on that. But um, in the score to one of his oratorios, he has a note that says the conductor should take care to make sure that the sopranos know all their notes and rhythms accurately, <laughs> as it has shown that they often do not, and they frequently basically just zone out in rehearsal and have no <laughs> idea what's going on. That's basically what it says. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I'll have to check that out. That's awesome. Yeah. I wonder if there could be like a blog about composers in the score dissing the music <laughs> and yeah. find all of those examples or other other composers how like, like, he disses all the serious guys there's mm -hmm. definitely some you know instruments that share a you know sort of underdog or black sheep family and i think the sopranos, percussionists, uh, viola players Violas, right. often get, you know, sort of the, the short end of the stick. Not mm -hmm. not literally, I no guess. But, yeah. <laughs> but there's that sort of dissing, and maybe is why I actually have a lot of close friends who are singers and viola players as well as percussionists. So maybe it's kind of this unwritten rule that bonds us together. <laughs> Very well could be. Ben, what do you have for us today? Yeah, so I was looking through Norm's website, and I, he has listed some of his recent repertoire that he's performed, and one of the pieces was Rhythm Strip by Eskel Masson, and I wanted to share about his works because we hadn't done that yet, and he's actually, I found it even a bigger comp percussion composer than I knew of. So just a quick little biographical information on him. He was born in 1953 in Iceland, and he began studying clarinet in 1961. He studied percussion at the, pardon my butchering of the Icelandic name, but at the Reykjavik College of Music. And then he also studied privately in London with James Blades. And does anyone know who James Blades' other really famous percussion student was? I do, I do. Norm? Uh, Evelyn Glennie. Evelyn Glennie is correct, yeah. <laughs> so he's got two pretty, pretty big name students. And if you're not familiar with James Blades, he wrote the uh, what's the, I can't remember the exact title. I think it's history or percussion instruments and their history book, which is like a, and if you're listening to this podcast, you should own that book. Uh, but Sadly anyway, out of print right now and very difficult to get your hands on. It's expensive. Yeah. 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 It's expensive, but it is 
totally worth it. But anyway, off topic aside. Uh, so anyway, in 19 from 1973 to 1975, Masson was the composer and percussionist for the Ballet of the National Theater of the Iceland State Radio. In 1978 to 83, he was the producer for the music department of the Icelandic State Radio. And then after 1983, he decided to pursue a full-time career as a completely freelance composer, no association with the university or anything. Um, it seems like around that time, he also got wrapped up in some sort of organizational work. From 1983 to 1985, he served as the Secretary General of the Society of Icelandic Composers. And from 1989 to 99, he was the President of the Performing Rights Society. As a composer, his music has been performed by many renowned performers, including the New York Philharmonic, the Cleveland Orchestra, the Toronto Symphony, and others. And conductors who have championed his works have included Esapekka Salonen and Leonard Slatkin. He has quite a few percussion works, which we'll talk about in a minute. But some of the percussionists that have championed his works have included the Krumata Percussion Ensemble, which we talked about on episode eight with Maria Finkelmeyer, if you want to listen to that one, Evelyn Glennie. Colin Curry, and sort of his number one proponent seems to be Gert Mortensen. Um, he has an extensive compositional output that includes symphonies, choral music, chamber music, and more. On his website, it's sort of like Alejandro Vignau, he actually has a dedicated percussion yeah. section where he has 35 works for percussion listed, which I had no idea he had that many but he has 35 works. And then as I clicked around the website more, I found even more like there was a duo for bass clarinet and percussion that wasn't listed on the percussion area. His percussion output includes six concertos, chamber music and solo music. And I just wanted to share uh, the names and a little bit about a few of his more uh, popular works. Uh, for percussion that I've, I think I've heard most of these actually performed live. Uh, the first big one is 1982 Concert Stuke, which is a piece for solo snare drum. And then there are different versions. There's a version with piano, there's a version with wind band, there's a version with brass band, and there's a version with percussion ensemble. And if you know his piece Prim, Concert Stuke is the sort of predecessor to that, has a lot of this sort of same uh, rhythmic language, I guess you could say. Two years later, in 1984, he composed Prim, which I believe was written for Gert Mortensen, and that's a snare drum solo, and it's based on the first 15 prime numbers, and that seems to be the sort of number one snare drum unaccompanied solo piece for many, many years that people perform. I got to see Evelyn Glennie perform that live when I was, I think, 15 years old, and it rocked my world. Uh, the next big piece is from from 1995 it's for nine drums it's four bongos four octobands did i say nine sorry i meant 13. four bongos four octobands four toms and kick drum it was written for evelyn glennie and it was dedicated to james blades their mutual teacher in 1997 he wrote rhythm strip which is a snare drum duo which i would love to hear norm talk about and in 2001, he wrote a piece called Kim. Kim means germ or embryo, and it's a snare drum solo that includes uh, practice pad and brushes parts. And I think that Kim is, from what I can see, I've never performed either. Kim is, I think, a much uh, easier piece than mm -hmm. Prim. So if anyone's interested in maybe a junior recital level piece, that'd be a good one to check out. So Norm, I know you've performed Rhythm Strip, and I saw Bill Mersch and Ricardo Flores perform it when I was a student at Illinois. So I'd love to hear your experience with um, playing it. Well, um, you know, it's, it's I, I learned a lot by your little introduction there with uh, that I had no idea that Evelyn and he were uh, both students of James Blades. And uh, because the first time I heard of any of his music was with uh, Evelyn's performance of Prim. And then I had been exposed to some other things after that. I'd never been uh, heard the concert stuke um, until I heard Evelyn play that live with the Tucson Symphony. She came through the uh, Tucson several years ago and, and played that piece with the orchestra as well as uh, Prim. And oh, she did the uh, little, 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 which percussion concerto she, did she do? Ah. Uh, I'll think of it as soon as I quit trying to think of it. Anyway, um, I, I was getting ready for a faculty recital 
at UA and uh, at the time Kim Toscano um, was an adjunct professor there and I wanted to do something with her. And so we were looking for duets that, you know, quite frankly, wouldn't take a thousand hours of uh, rehearsal time. <laughs> and uh, I had coached uh, Rhythm Strip one other time with two uh, undergrad students and uh, I remember that piece and I showed it to, to Kim Toscano and she said it looked like fun, so we put it together. Um, it was great working with her. It's a, it's a really interesting piece. I, I like his works. Um, I like snare drum pieces that are uh, creative and a, a Casey's written a bunch of really creative I don't want to get too far off the subject first, but okay. Casey, you know, let's talk about my stuff has stuff. really been um, uh, pushing the envelope on a lot of different uh, levels. So thank you for all of the uh, contributions that you've made to performance in the literature the last several years. Man, thank you. Nothing but respect and props for that. Um, so anyway, we, we put the piece together. I, I, it's it's interesting as a duet because there's plenty of times where there's interplay between the two musicians. Each have two drums. I think I had a, a regular snare drum and a field drum, and Kim had a regular snare drum and a piccolo. And so kind it's, of, it's written for one player is supposed to have a piccolo, the other player I think is supposed to have a regular snare drum and a field drum. Okay, so it's just three drums then between the two people? Yeah, okay, so she had the pick and I had a regular drum and the field drum, so I played that part. And uh, we just had a great time putting it together and talking about you know, structure and uh, which voices were, there was one little section that was really a booger to put together and have it fit. Other than that, it came together pretty quickly and there's uh, two nice uh, composed cadenza-like uh, sections in the piece. Um, one thing that makes it nice is that the other player has got something going on while the cadenza happens. So there's a, uh, for example, um, Kim played, I don't remember, the piccolo part has this little repeated short ostinato that stays in time while the cadenza thing is out of time. And then that reverses where I, the other player has something in time while the uh, second player or the first player, whatever the numbers are, uh, is out of time and can kind of do whatever they want to do musically with it. And uh, we had a great time with it. I, I recommend his music very highly. I've also coached uh, from and uh, Kim is a great piece and it, it, it is more approachable than Prim. Uh, and recommended for junior or each senior recitals. And it's a fun piece to listen to as well as a fun piece to play. And at the same time, while those are fun pieces to listen to and play, they go over well for the audience too. They're good compositions. They're well-structured, they're well put together and they work. My favorite is Kim. Yeah, isn't that a great piece? Yeah, yeah. I have to say those pieces, they, they get played a whole lot but I don't think they play themselves. I think you really have to play them. I mean, you really have to perform the the heck out of them. I think a lot of people approach them, say Prim, for instance, like, oh, this is neat because it's the system of numbers and da 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 da. Wait, no, that's you still have to like play though. Like you still have to. And if to play, if I can right, just to play, if I can just get on a soapbox for a minute. Very One thing that drives me crazy about Prim, if people could stop doing this, I would love it. Oh, is yeah. people put all the music on a board and like halfway through there's like i i guess it's a fermat or something and that's when they flip their board and it's the most awkward thing every single time i've seen it performed <laughs> the piece completely stopped and they like grab this gigantic i'm like like get an ipad or memorize it or figure something out that has ruined so many performances of prim for me <laughs> Please, percussionists, stop doing that at that moment. <laughs> okay, so here's a question for you. Here's a question for the four of you. It's extremely common to go to a piano recital and see a page turner on stage. How many times have you been to a percussion recital and seen a page turner on stage? Right. Right. Yeah, just once, yeah. 
Yeah. I have been a page turner on a percussion recital. Nope, that was for the pianist accompanying the percussionist. <laughs> <laughs> Is the no, I, percussion I don't concerto. see anything I, wrong with having somebody sitting on a chair, right. being relatively inconspicuous, just like they are with the piano, right. and every two or three pages, if necessary, stand up, turn the page, sit back down. Uh -huh. it, 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 it would alleviate this exact thing that you're talking about yeah. of having the kind of the fourth wall broken. You're no longer concentrating on the music. Uh, you're no longer in this other environment and in this weather. Excuse me, I, I have to turn my music over. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. Well, and it legitimizes. Uh, Gordon Stout, I saw perform with a page turner. Yeah. I was gonna say I have I have done page turns for. Sorry, Brian. I have done page turns for marimba solo before and percussion solo before, but it is not common. And just to clarify and agree with Ben, I think. Ben isn't just complaining about there being a page turn. He's complaining about where it comes. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, and, I, and I've had and, to say Yeah, that the too. way it interrupts, yeah. Right. And also, if, if there's a pause in the music and you use it to turn a page or adjust a cymbal, put some sticks down, pick some others back up, it's no longer a musical pause. It's a logistical pause. It's almost a, immediately everyone thinks, oh, the reason I'm witnessing this pause right now is for a logistical purpose, not for a musical purpose. Uh, right. Ryan, sorry I interrupted you. Well, no, I just, I totally, uh, Norm, I love your idea. Like, hey, why don't we have a uh, page turners? It's so standard and no one bats an eye when a pianist has that. So why couldn't another instrument? I mean, I think piano, you got both hands occupied. We're the same. There are lots of instruments that have that. So why couldn't we have one? It would sort of legitimize us and maybe put us back on the musician, the real musician profile. <laughs> okay, so here's an idea for you, for those of you that are technically inclined. You know, you had mentioned the iPad. So you get an iPad, you get an air turn pedal, and you, you still have to now, wherever you're playing, especially if it's a big multiple work, find where the damn pedal is and make sure that you hit the right one so that you don't go backwards the page instead of forwards the page. Right. Why doesn't somebody invent a small Bluetooth device that will fit in your mouth that when you air, air turn has that they have that for organists they do yeah really? if it's in there your mouth, you go. it's like a tooth thing yeah it's like a bite thing but i'm afraid like if i was doing that if i was getting into it i would accidentally bite it you know? yeah i would i know yeah. i would yeah same. i think we need life-size cyborg page turners mm. perfect like actual perfect my deal Problem with solved. iPads Podcast for us over, is that never again. <laughs> those um, I don't know for us to use iPads. Those have got to be some big ass iPads. Well, they like have the eight and a half by elevens now. I just bought one for that very reason. How do you like yeah. it? Ooh, nice. Does uh, it wow. I love it, and it's actually lighter than my old iPad. But I I I went to give a couple clinics and performances. And I was doing a piece that my hands were busy and I didn't want to do it. It's like, okay, well, I'm just going to bite the bullet and get the bigger iPad. And um, yeah, I did that instead of carrying music and it worked fine. And my colleague in, in two of the performances, they've got the big board and they're flipping it when they yeah. get to the opportunity. Um, so yeah, I, I highly recommend it. And, uh, yeah. What's the software that I'm using? Everybody uses the same Four thing. Fourscore. 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 I use and that. And a little air turn pedal. But I'm going to check out this this pressure yeah. thing. Hmm. Well, yeah, you know, like I said been... it was designed for organists. Yeah, but you're a drum set player. I was actually yeah. doing a piece um, called Concert Pop. Um, very cool piece for a modified drum set, super duper simple, kick drum, ride simple, snare drum, ride cymbal, snare drum. And then your other hand that's not playing the snare drum and the cymbal is, is uh, triggering little loops. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really clever. It almost reminded me compositionally of uh, Casey's piece, uh, uh, Glamour. Oh, okay. 
you know how glamour is the the compositional process of glamour sure, it's sure. a little bit similar um in that it's an additive thing and and uh i i think you guys would i mean i i, I heard it up on youtube and i thought oh geez i have to play this and this was that by who's the composer uh, um We'll find it and add it on. Yeah. Well, um, I play Glamour. All y'all go by like many times <laughs> Glamour. Well, but you have to have you know, I, heard, I think I heard you play it on, on a YouTube thing. And I kind of feel if a piece is going to speak to me, it speaks to me like in the first 20 seconds. And right, right. Uh, I, I was just, it's, it's like, I heard this one time, I thought, this is a little gem. Oh, this you. is, uh, this, you know, I hope I'm not insulting you. This isn't the world's best composition. That's, and it's not Beethoven 9. Agreed. But yeah. it's a little, it's a beautiful little gem. And uh, I think I emailed you that same day I heard it and said, I want to buy this. And uh, played it a couple times on recitals. The audience digs it, and I think it's brilliant. And I've had two students play it on recitals also. Did I hide Did I... up the price the same day you said you want to buy it? I, I don't think so. It was the regular 276 <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, Norm. That's, that's really kind. If there's something I try to watch out for, I mean, speaking of the, the scope, you know, you said it's a great piece, but it's not the world's greatest piece. Like, yeah, of course. I feel like with with this little trap table of wood blocks and clicking metronome and small symbols, yeah, like there is a scope that composers have to kind of pay attention to, you know. Um, anyway, uh, someone else is loaded up. What do you got there, Laurel? Well, I was just telling Ben, I might not say my thing, but I was going to add something onto the page turn conversation, yeah. so you can choose to edit this out if you want to. Oh, um, no, I just meant <laughs> for how the conversation was no, flowing good, away good. away from the topic. The, the idea of like flipping a board in a rest is, I hate the boards anyway, and I've been on a soapbox about that with our studio, and so I'm not going to do that here, but... Um, you know, I play marimba and I have a giant book and I turned my own pages. And so I feel like, you know, if you set the precedent from the beginning of your performance, it's like, I turn my own pages yeah, and I just do it. And it's how I make this happen. Then when you get to a moment like that and there's silence, there's a way that you can let the silence be there and then turn your page. And it's not so right. disruptive because you have to do. Yeah. Yeah, because you've set the precedent that that just is part of the performance from the beginning. So I don't think you like have to memorize something like Prim, although I do. It's probably much better if you do, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, well, does, doesn't um, Nancy Zeltzman do that same thing? Yeah, yeah. She, she reads everything. And, yeah. You know, she's just such a magnificent musician that I never even notice it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, so I feel like talking about. Nancy and I think Laurel plays this way too. The reading is part of the performance. Like you can tell she's like engaged with this almost like a, yeah. a duo partner. Like it's yeah. very engaging the way she's reading. Yeah. And it honors the composer. Yeah. They provided this manuscript that you're interpreting into sound. So it's yeah. part of the representation. Yeah, calm down, Ben. It's great. <laughs> so all this talk has but made me think of you guys, like, you know, Mark Applebaum has that piece for, like, the orchestra, like, taking in their mutes and putting out their, like, you know, like, I think Mark Applebaum is now going to write a piece for page turns. <laughs> that was a good, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, if he did, so it would be changing, awesome. Changing gear a little bit, I had, I had sort of done this on purpose. I name dropped in my little segment on rhythm strip, uh, Ricardo Flores. Yeah. Who, with my students, I like, I, or myself also, I like to know my sort of lineage with who my teacher's teachers were and all that sort of thing. So I guess technically Norm is my grand teacher because yeah, he was you're, my teacher's you're one of my teacher. grand students. And so, uh, so Norm, I was wondering if you could tell us about what Ricardo was like as a student and hopefully give us like a hilarious, embarrassing. <laughs> um, be funny, no pressure. 
Well, I, I can I can I can tell you that. Oh, I can't tell you a funny story about Ricardo. Uh, first of all, I love Ricardo. He is such a nice guy, funny as hell, an incredibly wonderful musician. Um, he gave our family our first puppy. Um, my my youngest daughter, when she was little, if there was a puppy like on the block, she wouldn't go outside because she was deathly afraid of dogs. And so I was at school and I would just mentioned to Ricardo that, you know, oh, yesterday my daughter went ballistic about it. I was a puppy four houses away. And, and Nancy and I decided that the way to cure her of this was to get a puppy. And he said, my dog just had puppies. I'll bring one by. And he did, and that was our first dog, was one of Ricardo's dogs, puppies. Um, so that, I mean, I, he was one of my first students at Del Mar, um, who went all the way through with me. Del Mar was a two-year junior college, and surprisingly had an amazing music program for a two-year junior college. And then there was a senior college down the street called Corpus Christi State University. So he graduated with me at, at Del Mar and then went to CCSU, so I had him for all four years. And the, the story is he was playing in the jazz band at CCSU. And I uh, went to go here, and he's playing in you know, a drum set. He was a great drum set player. And kind of like right in the middle of a phrase, he switched from doing something on the cymbals to, to the hi-hat. But it wasn't at what I thought should be the right point. It wasn't at the, at the end of a four-bar phrase or an eight-bar phrase. It was like... Um, beat three of somewhere else. And so it's like, whoa, it was, for me, it was really jarring. And so after the concert, I went back and talked to him and, you know, doing my little teacherly critique. And I said, you know, on this, on this particular piece, you, you, you changed your groove pattern right in the middle of a phrase. Why'd you do that? And he said, I, I just wanted to. Yeah. And it was like, well, I hadn't actually considered that as a possible answer before. Um, <laughs> it was like, my upbringing at the time was very structured, very kind of old school. You know, if you're going to do something like that, it happens at, the, at a structural, structurally significant point, et cetera, et cetera. And he just wanted to do it right then. And it kind of opened up my eyes and I thought, yeah, okay, well, as long as you had a reason, and your reason is you wanted to do it, I guess that's okay. That but uh, like a Ricardo reason. and I have kept up all of these years. Uh, we see each other at PASIC. We talk on the phone now and then. Um, he He's just a, a great guy. Just, I love him to death. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thanks. Brian, I think you have something for us today, right? Yeah, well, I'm again, I'm honored to be asked to come back and, and guest co-host with you guys. And when Ben asked me about something I wanted to share, um, what came to mind was something that um, this, this term that I learned of, um, it, it came at, I first heard this term uh, when the executive director for Boston Conservatory at Berkeley gave her state of the conservatory address. And it was kind of a just big picture vision, where are conservatories and performing arts going in the future? And she referred to this concept of genre combustion. Okay. Now, I, I'm not sure the origin of these words, um, if this was her topic, it was the first time I'd heard it. And I liked it because it really resonated with this idea that we can take different things and sort of break down the barriers between different art forms or different styles. Um, and I think, um, well, I, I'm a bit of a etymologist. Uh, uh, I'm a fan of word origins and lexicon valley and all that stuff. Um, for those listening, etymology, you can cut this part out. That's the study of words, not entomology, which is the study of bugs. So, all right. <laughs> no, that's okay. I think we, I, I needed that. That's okay. Good. Okay. Um, so, you know, genre, as we know, I mean, that's 
I'm reading a, di a dictionary.com definition here, which is a class or category of artistic endeavor having a particular form, content, technique, or the like. We, we know lots of things uh, that can fall into that category. I looked up the word combustion, and its first definition is the act or process of burning. Rapid oxidation accompanied by heat and usually light. Or my favorite, violent excitement and tumult. So it's the idea of not just challenging, but breaking these barriers between genres. And um, I bring this up um, because like an example of that um, would be the most recent Broadway blockbuster, for those of you who follow, is Hamilton, which takes the musical theater idiom and is completely, almost exclusively um, performed with rap and hip hop and spoken word. There's not very much traditional musical theater singing in the show, and it totally exploded as this new kind of genre that combines these disparate uh, styles of music into one. Um, that to me is an awesome example of genre combustion. And it's sort of, I, I, I also feel related um, that we t we've talked about Leonard Bernstein. He was actually quite adventurous in the way that he didn't stick between, you know, he, he merged the opera and musical theater and classical symphonic worlds beautifully that I kind of, wish that was, I wish he was still around or someone like him who continued to write and perform and advocate. Time. And what's that? He caught a lot of flack for that too at the time. Yeah, it's like he was sort of an advocate, an early advocate to allow for this kind of future uh, genre combusting. Um, I would be remiss if I am not also going to shamelessly plug my own little version of this genre combustion and that's in the form of um, what I developed um, just a few months after my first, my percussion podcast with you guys um, back in 2016. Um, I put on a show called the Marimba Cabaret that takes my love of musical theater, pop songs. I cover, arrange, and adapt for marimba, vibraphone, percussion, and my own voice. I sing and play and basically combine all of my loves into one place. Uh, I combine my classical training with, you know, pop and um, classical, excuse me, pop and musical theater tunes. And frankly, I just took the songs I liked singing at karaoke and arranged them and accompanied myself. And this is now we're entering a third season of performances um, in Boston. That's been, you know, a real big thrill for me. Brian, I have to say that, uh, you know, it happens now and again, you say you go to school with a classmate and you think, wow, they're really good. And then you both separate for years and then you see them perform again. You're like, holy cow, they were good before and they got better. Whoa, mm -hmm. that is, and it like scares you again, you know, and I, <laughs> I keep seeing this happen with people I know and people I went to school with. And I have to say, yeah, looking at your most recent Rimba Cabaret stuff, I got that feeling again. It's like, whoa, dude, he was so good at this before, and he's gotten oh. even better. It's really cool. Thank you. Well, I just feel lucky to find, like, my passion project, find something that really speaks and represents all of the things that I love. And, you know, I feel like there's more out there, more genre combusting uh, happening. Do, do you happen to... Well, I just heard recently it's the 50th anniversary of the Broadway show Hair, Isn't which yeah. in 1968 was just as genre combustible oh, yeah. as, uh, as Hamilton is. Yeah, it was unlike anything else on the, I mean, you had Rodgers and Hammerstein, like Carousel was, right. I think, that same year. It could not be more different, but now is like celebrated and um, standard. Do you happen to know Doug Smith? Yes, yeah, in uh, Utah, I think. Utah, okay. Yeah. I wanted to just, with you doing voice and marimba together, you guys should. He does it, yep. We We have talked about how we could take over the world with marimba and voice. Um, there's some ideas and opportunities that were sort of cooking up on the back burners, but something may happen. That's great. When you two take over the world, I'd like to put in my recommendation to be Secretary of State. Please. Oh, great. You need somebody, right? Yeah, you're okay. nominated. <laughs> it reminds me of a conversation, I 
think we had on the Michael Spiro episode talking about cross-culture collaborations and how a lot of times they don't work because people will say, oh, let's, let's combine these, I, I don't know, let's combine these two styles. And so they have a string quartet playing arrangement of a jazz tune and you can just like really see the obvious transplant. Yeah. And it's like, okay, we, if we can still tell them, if we can still see them that distinctly, it's not genre combusting. They have it's to, not real. yeah, right. Like they have to be, they have to like make a new thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's cool that you mentioned it, Brian, because I think it just adds more to a, a, a conversation that, yeah, yeah we had it's to... more about like synthesizing them and creating a new, like by synthesizing two different styles, they kind of create a new texture or composite. It's yeah. not just like putting them on at the same time or playing them side by side or doing like a medley one after another, that, that doesn't really synthesize with the core of those styles. And, and doesn't it have to be, uh, doesn't it have to be kind of the outgrowth of the artist that puts them together? I mean, like what, what Casey just mentioned of let's take this thing and this thing and put it together because nobody's done that before or because that would be cool. And it does become very obvious that it that it's not authentic and it's not the it's not really as you said synthesized they're two separate things side by side instead of yeah yeah really unified into a whole yeah, yeah. it's like casey like what you said about playing i think it was prim or kim yeah one of them about the math where you're like oh you just if you just play the notes it plays itself like right. no you really have to yeah. you have to communicate something it has to be authentic mm -hmm. you can't just mash these things together and expect them to you know to to get along yeah yeah i could not agree more yeah norm so i was i was reading your article on gen 16 ae symbols in i think it's drummer magazine or drum magazine it was in drum magazine yeah yeah drum magazine thank you and you 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 have this really catchy introduction i wanted to ask you kind of how you think about it now and sorry to totally just drop this on you i know you wrote it many years ago but you start by saying several years ago i wrote an article stating that i was a little worried about the current state of percussion technology my point was that if percussionists didn't adopt new technical technological advances companies wouldn't be motivated to move forward and create new gear with all the great advances in this field that have emerged in the last year or two uh, which are, some are coming down the pike right now, my fears have been cast away. And of course, you're talking, you're introducing these Gen X, uh, sorry, uh -huh. these Gen 16 Zildjian symbols, which are, of course, those like low volume or uh, really no volume symbols that are have microphones built into them. How do you still feel about that? How are we doing as far as percussion hopping on with technology and developing new things? Do you think, are your fears still cast aside? Is it? Well, I don't know. It, it, it seems that, you know, I, I've been involved in the, the electronic side of percussion and percussion technology things for, for a while. So and it seems like I, I just keep getting brought into this discussion of, well, they're not yet real instruments or they're not as expressive as acoustic drums. Or, um, it, uh, In fact, I, I think one of the most recent articles I wrote, I'm back on that same bandwagon and that uh, you know, the, the companies that create this stuff, let, let's face it, 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 it ain't cheap. It, it isn't like I can go hollow out a tree and kill a cow and put the head on the drum and, and, and say, here's my new design. This stuff requires programmers. It requires people who are into uh, software design, hardware design, circuitry, all that. That doesn't come cheap. And if they, if the manufacturers can't make a living or make a profit on it, they're gonna they're gonna say, well, this isn't worth it. The audience isn't there. People aren't interested in this, um, which I think would would be a big mistake. And I I don't hear guitar players complaining about metal strings as opposed to nylon strings. I don't hear 
uh, keyboard players saying, you know, I just hate the Hammond B3. It doesn't feel like my Steinway. Uh, they're different instruments, and they're not going to, um, they're not going to feel the same. They're not going to sound the same. They're not going to behave the same. They're, they're different things. No, <laughs> you know, this, this woodblock just doesn't feel like my calf snare drum head. I can't get the touch and sensitivity from, uh, it's like, you know, play the freaking woodblock and make music on the woodblock and don't worry about what the woodblock can't do. Sure. Um, so anyway, I think there are some uh, cool things coming down the pike that have gotten some people excited. I, I think that the the Gen 16 idea by itself didn't really pan out like I had hoped that it would. Um, I don't know what the sales have been on that, but the idea of soundless or way reduced sound symbols have now kind of moved in the realm of uh, practice instruments more than they've moved in the realm of replacing uh, electronic drum pads. But now uh, Pearl has just come out with this mallet station thing, which is a, a, a mallet cat kind of similar instrument that uh, seems to be very cool. I don't think it's quite shipping yet, but uh, it seems to be very cool. There are some new electronic drum brains coming out on the market. There are some, some advances in um, tracking, in simplicity of operation, uh, so that they're not quite so daunting. Yeah. Um, that, that I think is going to be good, and I see more people uh, gradually dipping their toe in the water. Uh, a, a big plug for uh, one of my students, Jeff Friedel, who's now on tour with A Perfect Circle. I went to go hear him play uh, last last night. Oh, cool. I like that. It was awesome. The, the BFD Festival in, in Dallas 20, sold out stadium 20,000 people yeah, sure. in this facility um, I heard the last four bands and three of the drummers had some sort of technology helping them either I think in the first band it almost seemed like he was running backing tracks that he was the person triggering that stuff and then he had a couple pads that you know played the hand clap uh, the thick hand clap sound for that particular thing. So, in, 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 uh, so three out of those four groups, the drummers were using some sort of technology. Um, and I think it's slowly getting uh, assimilated to, to, to being okay. To, to me, it's always been just another sound source. It's just been another color that can be in the palette. No different than when the vibraphone first came out. It's like, hey, this is cool. It's not gonna feel the same as a xylophone, but you know, it's kind of cool. And it's got this pedal thing on it. Notes will ring a really long time. And, and uh, you know, I wish it had four more octaves worth of notes, but it doesn't. Um, <laughs> nobody seemed to complain about that at the time. Anyway, that's my, my little soapbox. I think it is getting better. Mm -hmm. um, I think some companies are making money on it. I think the smaller companies are still not afraid to try it and see what happens with it. Um, and the bigger companies are now kind of taking over. So uh, I heard something recently. Roland sells more drum sets than Yamaha. Oh, wow. I mean, rather than, than acoustic drums. That's they, they they sell more electric drum, or maybe it's dollar wise. They have a higher dollar income than something. So so those drums are getting sold. So maybe it's the it's not the drum workshop or the uh, Ludwig's that are going to take their foot into the electronic water, dip their foot into the electronic waters. But it's the Roland and the Yamaha and the Pearl through their association with uh, McMillan, mm -hmm. Keith McMillan Industries, um, or Keith McMillan Instruments, that maybe they're going to push things forward. It does seem to me that there is a, a it, you know, speaking of electronic drum sets, it's weird, you know, the, the goal, and of course I have a very limited background in this and a very short history of knowledge with it, but the goal used to be, okay, 
let's try to make an acoustic sound, but it's not acoustic. Let's try to make yes. like the best, you know, and it seems like that has shifted a whole lot. You know, so that's not hard anymore. You know, that's not the utility of this anymore. The utility is uh, what what entirely new sounds can there be? And, 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 and what, like, yeah, like w what flexibility can we provide now, you know? And, and I think that, that that's great. That in, enlarges the, the, the palette of, of sounds and colors and tones that we can make. You know, again, I don't know any electric guitar that was advertised as this is this is sounds exactly like your acoustic guitar, but louder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, I was listening to your CD Quilt, which I think was oh, thank you. 2006 that came out. Yeah, 2009? it's a while ago. Sorry? I said, yeah, I think it's a while ago. It's, um, doing... I, I was just going to ask quick, we're totally out of time, but I was going to ask, how do you since we're on this topic, how do you approach, how do you think composing for electronic sounds is different than composing for, say, a, a set of acoustic instruments? Like how, I don't know, how's that change your approach? Um, for, for me personally, it's, it's a combination of two things. It's sitting down and goofing around <laughs> in, until... I find something that um, inspires me, if that makes sense. And then if I can build it, what is it they say? Composing is 5% inspiration and 95% perspiration or something like that. Um, so it's pretty easy to get the 5%. Um, but then the rest of it is a lot of hard work. Yeah. And so what I'm looking for is something that's going to inspire me and serve as that 5%, but then I can also expand. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing which really helps me out is if I have some sort of a, I, I can't just sit down and make funny sounds and think that that's going to happen. Uh, so if I have something in mind, um, like a musical concept in mind or a, uh, a structural concept in mind or to try to, do a musical depiction. Uh, my daughter's artwork is behind me, one of her pieces. Oh, nice. Um, wow. And if I can, if I can have an idea before I start playing around with sounds, uh, one of the pieces on the CD is called uh, uh, Beijing. And that started with just a frame, a set of frame drum samples that were really I, they just knocked me out. And then trying to capture the mood of this two-string Erhu player that I heard under a tunnel in Beijing mm -hmm. um, that just blew me. In my, and this, this guy was sitting there on a, he had no legs and he was blind and he was on like a little big skateboard kind of thing. And he had this Urnu stringed instrument and he was just playing his heart out. Um, it, was, it was amazing. And everybody was just walking past him as you might like see on a New York subway or something like that too. And we stopped and listened to this guy for a long time. I think we were the only people that were actually listening to him, but it was, it was amazing. Yeah. So then the composition for that piece was to try to somehow replicate that mood. I was interested to ask that because some people, it's like, oh, I'm writing for electronics. That changes everything. Whereas other people, it's like, no, it's just you're dealing with a different set of possibilities and, um, you know, you um, yeah, approach it the same way, basically. So it's, Well, let, let me tell you about one of the other, you, I mean, if we're out of time, I can cut this out too, but the title of that um CD quilt. Uh, my wife does a lot of quilting, and when the kids were little, we used to play quilt, which was uh, we, my wife would throw out a bunch of fabrics on the bed, and the kids would sit on the bed, and they would talk about how the fabrics fit together, and whether this pattern goes with that pattern, and uh, how complementary colors worked, and and set up, you know, small pieces of fabric and quilt like. Things and it was, it was a pretty cool way, I think, to uh, interact with the kids and yeah, teach them about 
visual patterns and all, all that kind of stuff. And so the, the piece that I wrote, I must have had, I created, I think, I don't know, a couple hundred, 250 different musical events. And then I made a quilt out of them. And uh, I stuck them all on a, on a timeline and just moved them around till I got what I thought sounded pretty nice. And I took it into school and uh, Beth Cucci, who's now Ben Cucci, who is a uh, uh, film, scores films out in LA. And another student of mine, uh, Jack Sturbus, um, I said, hey, I want you to listen to something. I just finished this last night. And I played it for him. And Beth gave me an amazing compliment. She says, that's one of the coolest things I ever heard. And Jack says, nine more and you got an album. And I thought, yeah, why don't I do this? So that's, that's how that got started. And that's why the name is Quilt. Man, very cool. Well, you guys, thanks so much for joining us on 147. Brian, Ben, Laurel, and man, Norm Weinberg. It's always great to hang out. Oh, well, thank you so much. This was great fun. Cool, cool. Okay, everybody, take care. Bye, Laurel. Bye, Casey. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>